In this presentation, we are going to take a look at principles and doctrines found in the book of Galatians, which is chapters 1 through 6. So the book of Galatians, which has six chapters. This is by way of introduction. All of Paul's epistles were written for the saints of God, for those who belong to the church, for those who already know the doctrines of salvation, for those who have the gift of the Holy Ghost and are thereby able to interpret and understand the apostles' teachings. That's why those in the world misunderstand and corrupt the epistles is because Paul's writing to members of the church already know certain basic doctrines that the world does not know. And so the, the, the epistles are not meant to non-members. It was meant to help members and newly converted members of the church who had already been taught the basic gospel principles. But they are also written to answer the question and solve the problem of the specific groups of saints. And in the case of Galatians, the problem is apostasy. These Galatians are Gentile converts. They are now being contaminated by Jewish Christians who tell them they must also be circumcised and live the law of Moses to be saved. Paul's purpose is to call them back to Christ and his gospel. You're going to see throughout this presentation that the Jews who converted to Christianity just could not let go of the law of Moses. It had become such a tradition and it became such a burden and caused so much false doctrine. And Paul is trying to address that in Galatia, that the law of Moses is fulfilled, but the Jewish Christians just will not let go of it. The first stage of apostasy that swept through the early church involved Jewish Christians who seemed unable to abandon their Judaic traditions. The Galatian saints attempted to revise the gospel by including pagan observance and mosaic rituals as circumcision. As adopted members of the Abrahamic covenant, perhaps they believed that the rite of circumcision, so important in Abraham's day, see Genesis 17.10, and other aspects of the Mosaic law were the basis of Christ's gospel. Their zeal led them to keep certain aspects of that law and required all baptized males to be circumcised. Paul teaches in this epistle that Christ is not secondary to the law of Moses. The law with his specific requirements cannot bring salvation. Only Christ can. Salvation comes through the merits of Christ alone. This epistle has been called a declaration of independence from Judaism. The terms free and freedom are used 11 times in the brief letter. It's just like no matter how many times you go to the temple, brothers and sisters, that will not save you. If you do not become like Christ and start gaining the attributes of Christ, even though you go to the temple every week, if you're not becoming like him, you will not receive salvation. Salvation is only in Jesus Christ, even today, not in any of the church's programs. There is not one program in this church that has power to save anyone in exaltation. Galatians and Romans, the Pauline epistles that most closely resemble Galatian content, intent, content and argument, were the spiritual foundations of the Protestant Reformation. They led Martin Luther to break from the Roman Catholic Church. Thus, Paul's words become an ep epitaph to the great religious revolution of the 16th century. A monumental theme in Galatians is that justif justification comes not by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Thus are we free from the curse of the law, of the law Galatians 3.13. Paul says the same things in Romans. Quote, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law, meaning the law of Moses. That's Romans 3, 23-24 and 28. 
Jesus Christ alone can declare us righteous and put us back in a right relationship with God. See, the law of Moses could never do that. Galatians supports the truth of grace and justification taught by Nephi in the Book of Mormon. Galatians shares with Romans several terms and phrases found nowhere else. These include, love thy neighbor as thyself, as the sum of Christian duty, Galatians 5.14, Romans 13.9. The language of adoption and heirship, Galatians 4.4.7 and Romans 8.14-17. And the expressive statements, Abba, Father, uttered by the Savior at his final cry, Galatians 4, 8, Romans 8, 15. This final declaration of the Savior denotes an especially close, uniquely personal relationship to God. The Aramaic Abba may be more accurately translated Daddy or Papa. Paul's main purpose in writing to the epistle to the Galatians includes one, defending himself against the accusations of the false teachers who supposed him, two, teaching that all people, whether Jew or Gentile, are, sa are saved by the atonement of Jesus Christ, by placing their faith in Jesus Christ, not by performing the works of the law of Moses, and three, clarifying the role of the law of Moses in God's plan. Four, distinguishing between the old covenant God made through Moses and the new covenant in Christ. And five, calling upon the saints to live by the Spirit. See, even during the Old Testament when they lived the law of Moses, that did not save you. The reason why you lived the law of Moses is one, it was a commandment from Christ, and it was his program to teach them about Christ. It was a lesser law because they could not handle or live the higher law of the Melchizedek priesthood. Remember when he comes down from the mount with the plates and they are worshiping the false idol that Aaron had made, the golden calf, and God and Moses realized they are not ready for the Melchizedek priesthood and the ordinances of the temple and all of that. And see, so he goes back up and gets the law of Moses as a schoolmaster, a teacher, to teach them and point them to Christ. Then that would save them. When they offered sacrifice and the law of Moses, the sacrifice of the animal didn't save them. It was their faith that symbolized the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that would save them. And they had lost that whole meaning. They had turned the law of Moses into a program that was a program of salvation. Galatians 1, preachers of false gospels are accused. Galatians 1, 1-7, ye are so soon removed unto another gospel. Paul typically began his epistles with words of gratitude and praise for the saints he was addressing, even when they were in need of correction. His epistle to the Galatians lacks any expression of thanksgiving or praise. Rather, Paul immediately confronted the Galatian saints with the charge of following false teachers. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, describes the circumstances in Galatia. Paul's epistles are written to answer the question and solve the problem of a specific group of saints. And in the case of the Galatians, the problem is apostasy. These Galatians are Gentile converts. They are now being contaminated by Jewish Christians who tell them they must also be circumcised and live the law of Moses to be saved. Paul's purpose is to call them back to Christ and his gospel. Quote, Galatians is thus written to people who are losing the true faith, who are adopting false doctrines and ordinances and are being overcome by the world, who are commingling the dead law of Moses with the living word which is in Christ, end of quote. President Harold B. Lee quoted Paul's warnings to the Galatian saints found in Galatians 1, 6-12, and then declared, Today these warnings are just as applicable as they were in the day in which they were given. 
there are some as wolves among us. By that I mean some who profess membership in this church who are not sparing the flock. And among our own membership, men are rising, speaking perverse things. Now, perverse means diverting from the right or correct and being obstinate in the wrong, willfully in order to draw the weak and unwary members of the church away after them. And as the Apostle Paul said, it is likewise a marvel to us today as it was in that day that some members are so soon removed from those who taught them the gospel and are removed from the true teachings of the gospel of Jesus Christ. End of present least quote. Galatians 1, 6-7, another gospel, which is not another. Elder Bruce R. McConkie states at best when he says, that there is and can be only one gospel, one church, one plan of salvation, one true religion, religion is as self-evident as any truth known to man. There can no more be two true gospels or two true churches than there can be two true and differing scientific facts. Truth is truth, and truth and salvation and the gospel are all ordained of God. They are what they are, and they are not what they are not. Men either have the truths of salvation, or they do not. They either possess the gospel, which is the plan of salvation, or they do not. If they have the gospel, it is, in over, all scope and in minutest detail, exactly what Paul had. If any part or portion of their system of religion differs from what the ancient apostles taught and believed, what they have is, in fact, a perversion of the, gospel, of the true gospel. There is no more sense or reason in saying that two different churches are both true than in claiming that black and white are both the same color. Galatians 1, 8 through 10, an angel from heaven. Paul's teachings recorded in Galatians chapter 1, 8 through 10 are sometimes used erroneously to argue against visions and angels and preaching a restored gospel. The true gospel is preached by authorized apostles, as Paul was. It is grounded in the grace of Christ. It is grounded in personal testimony. It encompasses all of Paul's teachings. If an angel comes to divert the people away from this gospel, and here is an example from Alma chapter 30, through 53, which says, But behold, the devil hath deceived me, meaning Korhor, for he appeareth unto me in the form of an angel, and said unto me, Go and reclaim this people, for they have all gone astray after an unknown God. And he said unto me, There is no God, yea, and he taught me that which I should say, and I have taught his words. And I taught them because they were pleasing unto the carnal mind. And I taught them even until I had much success, insomuch that I verily believed that they were true. And for this cause I withstood the truth even until I have brought this great curse upon me. Ending the quote by Korohor. Then that angel should be ignored. That's what he is talking about. Don't accept gospel from angels. Angels that are Satan angels that appear to be true and are teaching false doctrine. They should be ignored. But scriptures show that several angels came to restore the fullness of the gospel, as is the case with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. See Revelations chapter 14, verse 6. So Paul was not teaching that angels would not come to teach the gospel. He was talking about angels from Satan who tried to appear as teaching the truth. Paul is cautioning against those who come along with imitations. The Judaizers were preaching a different, different gospel, attempting to get Christian converts to view the Mosaic Law as the foundation and Christianity as an addition. Where in actuality, the law of Moses is done away with, and Christianity and the law and doctrine of Christ is the only thing that now counts. Galatians 1, 8 through 9, Preach any other gospel than that which we have preached, let him be accursed. What gospel is this? 
Is it the gospel of God concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord? Is it that God is the creator, that Christ is the redeemer, and that based on his atoning sacrifice, men may be saved by obedience to his laws and ordinances? Is it a gospel of faith, repentance, baptism, reception of the Holy Ghost, and enduring in righteousness to the end? It is a gospel of priestly power received from God, of apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and numerous legal administrators, of miracles, tongues, gifts of the Spirit, revelations, visions. It is the everlasting gospel, the gospel of Adam, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, and the Nephites, and Jaredites, and of Joseph Smith and the Latter-day Saints. It is the same gospel preached by an angel sent from God in heaven to man on earth in modern times. It is the gospel recorded in the Bible, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. It is the power of God whereby men are saved in his kingdom. And in this day and age, it is found only in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Let him be accursed. Paul is meaning who? Anyone in heaven or on earth, in time or eternity, in Paul's day or or ours, anyone who preaches any gospel other than the true one. Why? Because there is no salvation in a false religion. There is no saving power in a man-made system of salvation. Man does not have power to create a celestial kingdom any more than he has power to resurrect himself. Religion comes from God. He created it. He ordained it. He established the laws and conditions where under salvation may be gained. And any man, whether mortal or immortal, whether man or angel, who preaches any system other than the very one ordained by a deity, leads men astray and keeps them from gaining celestial salvation. Now that is not saying that other Christian churches don't do some good and teach some truths. But there is only one that is the living church of Christ and has the ordinance of salvation and that is the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. To whom then does the apostles make reference? Specifically to false teachers among the Galatians, but in principle to all false teachers, teachers of whom Nephi said, quoting, and all those who preach false doctrines, woe, woe, woe be unto them, saith the Lord God Almighty, for they shall be thrust down to hell. End of Nephi's quote. I, I, I think he's pretty specific there. Galatians 1.10, if I yet please men. One of the chief identifying characteristics of the true gospel is that it is not pleasing to the carnal mind. It does not make friends with the world. It does not please worldly people. Those who choose to eat, drink, and be merry, who are unclean and immoral, who are proud and worldly, always find themselves in opposition to the truths of salvation and to the organization which sponsors and teaches them. Galatians 1, 11 through 13 Paul Conversion The true gospel of Jesus Christ was not created by mankind, but came by revelation. Just as with Joseph Smith, Jesus Christ revealed himself to Paul and taught him the gospel. No one ever receives the true gospel from man. It is not taught by man's power, but draws upon true converts by the power of the Spirit in the form of personal testimony. This is why a missionary converts no one. He is just the instrument to teach. The Holy Ghost is the converter. Once the spirit of testimony is planted in the heart of a man, the doors open for the revelation of that added light knowledge which assures an inheritance in the heavens above. Verses 13 and 14, Paul is saying, In proof of this, consider how unlikely it is that I, an intense Jewish zealot and a fierce persecutor of the church, should have been transformed into a preacher of Christ by any merely human means. Verses 15 16. But when God, who hath chosen me from my birth and graciously called me, disclosed Christ to my heart and designated me his messenger, I did, re I did not resort to human authority, authorities in order to learn what my message was to be. Verse 17. 
I did not visit the primitive apostles to learn anything from them, but went away into the seclusion of Arabia, and thence returned not to Jerusalem, but to Damascus. I did not visit the seat of apostolic influences might have been expected. The apostle retired to the wilderness in the neighborhood of Damascus, which was at the time subject to the king of Arabia, for thought and prayer. Perhaps it was there that he saw some of those visions and revelations of the Lord which he refers to in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Verses 18-19 After my conversion, my course was such as to prove my independence of human teachers. I was three years before I visited Jerusalem. Then I went to interview Peter, and my stay was a short one. Of the other apostles, I saw only James. Verse 20. I solemnly assert the truth of these statements. Verse 21. I next traveled through Syria and Sicilia to my native providence. Verses 23 through 24 in chapter 1. Up to this time, I was personally quite unknown to the Judean believers. They had merely heard that I, the fierce persecutor, had now become a preacher of the gospel, and they gave thanks to God for my conversion. Galatians chapter 2. The saints are children of God by faith. Galatians 2, 1 through 5, Judaizers desire to continue circumcision. Galatians 2, 1 records a journey Paul took to Jerusalem to meet with church leaders, and Titus traveled with him. He sent seeking official sanction for the work that he, Barnabas, Titus, and others were engaged in. He reported to them, probably in detail, what his teachings were. He did not make known unto them some new gospel which differed from theirs. Both he and they believed and taught the same eternal truths. He was simply letting his superior judges, you know, the apostles that were over him, probably the first presidency, the soundness and truth of his views. Titus, who was a Greek, did not have to be circumcised, although some Judaizers wanted all Gentiles to be circumcised in order to continue to obey the rituals of the law of Moses. The Joseph Smith translation clarifies, quote, There were some brought in by false brethren unawares, who came in privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us unto bondage. End of Joseph Smith's translation. These spies who were brought in by false brethren desired to force Christians, such as Titus, to give up their liberty in the gospel and return to the bondage of the law of Moses. As I told you, the Jewish Christians who converted could not let go of it, just as some in the church today cannot let go of some of the traditions we have. And it will be to, our, to your or my detriment if we don't let go of them. Verse 5, we maintained our position firmly in order to preserve for you and for all like you the distinctive truth of the gospel as follows that faith in Christ is the one condition of salvation. Galatians 6, Paul was not impressed with the rank and status of leading brethren who in fact added nothing to his knowledge and understanding of the gospel. Galatians 2, 7 through 8. Labels commonly used in the early church were they of circumcision, meaning Jews, and they of uncircumcision, meaning the Gentiles. Primarily, Peter taught the gospel to those who were circumcised, to the Jews, in whose flesh was the token of the covenant made with Abraham their father. Paul, on the other hand, went primarily to the uncircumcised Gentiles, those outside the once favored lineage. Both presented the same saving truths. But to Peter, it was the gospel of the circumcision because it grew out of the law of Moses and it was for those who had been circumcised. While to Paul, it was the gospel of the uncircumcision because it offered the same salvation to those who had never been privileged to have the original blessings of the covenant of circumcision. It was a matter of emphasis and perspective and not a matter of substance. So Peter was teaching the same substance to the Jews as Paul was teaching to the Gentiles. Galatians 9, verse 9 in chapter 2. 
The leaders of the church extended the full hand of fellowship to the missionaries and renewed their commission to continue taking the gospel to the Gentiles while they themselves, the leaders, continued working with the Jews. It is possible that this visit, or the previous one, gave Peter the opportunity to ordain Paul to the apostleship. Galatians verse 10 in chapter 2. They were to always to remember the poor and take care of their needs as Paul was forward, meaning zealous, to do. It is interesting that in the four standard works of the gospel, taking care of the poor and the needy is imperative if one is to truly live the gospel of Jesus Christ. Quote, 2 Nephi 21-2, through two, Woe unto them that decree unrighteous decrees, and that right grievousness, which they have prescribed, to turn away the needy from judgment, and to take away the righteous from the poor of my people, that widows may be their prey, and that they may rob the fatherless. James chapter 127 says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Ezekiel chapter 1649 says, Behold, this was the iniquity of their sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor in the needy. Even though they had plenty, they would not take care of them. And then in Doctrine and Covenants 44, 6, it says, Behold, I say unto you, that ye may, must visit the poor and the needy, and administer to their relief, that they may be kept until all things be done according to my law, which ye have received. Amen. All four standard works tell we must take care of the poor and the needy, or we will stand condemned. Galatians Chapter 2, verses 11 through 14, Paul's confrontation with Peter. A controversy arose between Paul and Peter over basic matters of church policy. We do not have the details, and we only have Paul's side of the story. The men involved in these conflicts were strong, faithful men. Even great leaders can and do disagree, yet they were faithful, and we revere them. Even apostles and prophets, being mortal and subject to like passions as other men, have prejudices which sometimes are reflected in ministerial assignments and decisions. But the marvel is not the isolated disagreement on details, but the near universal unity on basic principles. Not the occasional personality conflict, but the common acceptance for the good of the work of the faults of others. It is not the conflict between Paul and Barnabas which concerns us, but the fact that they, being even as we are, rose thereafter to spiritual hearts, heights where they saw visions, received revelations, and made their callings and elections sure. The fact of their disagreement thus bearing witness that we in our weakness can also press forward to that unity and perfection which assure us of salvation. Even those who stand highest among the church leaders have their human weaknesses. Paul may have, Paul may have to rebuke Peter, Galatians 2, 11-13. But when they forgave each other, God forgives them. It is a true statement that great men may err. A higher finish with such is that their greatness is enhanced by acknowledging their errors. Galatians chapter 2 verses 11 through 14. Paul's confrontation with Peter continued. Peter visited the saints in Antioch in Pisidia where Paul was staying. While there, Peter began to dine with the Gentile saints, but he stopped doing so when a group of Jewish Christians arrived from Jerusalem. He feared that the visitors would find his association with the Gentile saints offensive. Galatians 2.12 In many cultures of the ancient world, including the Jewish culture, dining with others affirmed a bond of fellowship and loyalty. To some Jewish Christians, the cultural traditions of maintaining separa separation from Gentiles was more important than the Christian bond they shared with the Gentile saints. You see, they just can't let go of this Law of Moses thing. This was unacceptable to Paul. He taught that among the followers of Christ, there was to be neither Jew nor Greek, for you 
are all one in Christ Jesus, Galatians 3.8. Paul felt that Peter's withdrawal from the Gentile saints implied they could not enjoy fellowship with church members like Peter unless they lived as do the Jews, Galatians 2.14. It is important to remember that we have only Paul's account of this confrontation and that Paul acknowledged that Peter's ministry was primarily to the Jews. See Galatians 2, 7 through 8. Peter, in running the church, is trying to balance between the traditions that the Jews can't let go of and the Gentiles coming into the church and trying to get rid of the false teachings they have been taught all their life before they were converted and trying to bring the two to a unity of the faith, just like we see today in the church today. In defense of the chief apostle, however, wants to recall that Peter was the leader of a relatively small church that was composed of two emotionally fragile fractions. The situation was delicate. The Jewish Christians, on the one hand, did not appreciate the reluctance of some Gentiles to submit to the regulations of the Mosaic law, especially circumcision. Paul and his followers, on the other hand, were not worried about offending the feelings of the Jewish Christians who still held fast to the traditions of the law of Moses. Peter, the prophet, naturally loved and was concerned about both Jew, Jewish and Gentile members of the church. It was, it was a no-win situation for Peter. If he continued eating with the Gentiles, he would offend the visiting group of Jewish Christians. If he departed, he would offend Paul and the Gentile Christians in Antioch. No compromise was possible. Either way, he was going to hurt some feelings. Maybe Peter felt that an offended Paul would still remain true, while an offended group of Jewish Christians would potentially influence many others to dissent or leave the young church. I, I think that's probably one of the best great examples of why the, this contention between Paul and Peter, that they finally reconciled, became good friends, but just seeing all the different dynamics in the church at play and what Peter is dealing with. Conspicuously absent from Galatians 2 is any reference to the Jerusalem conference held in AD 49, see Acts 15. This is when Peter, as the prophet and president of the first presidency, declares that the law of Moses and circumcision is no longer necessary. Okay? That was held in AD 49. Paul was a participant in that conference, and he later shared the decision of that conference with those who were minist he ministered, see Acts 15.30 and 16.4. Since Paul made no mention of the conference or the letters describing the decision to take the gospel to the Gentiles, some experts believe that the experience described in Galatians 2.11-21 occurred prior to the Jerusalem conference. And so they're still working out the restoration of the gospel. Remember, Israel's been under apostasy. Peter and his 12 in First Presidency is restoring the church in Christ's day, just as Joseph Smith and his were. And Joseph Smith and his leaders had problems that they had to work out because they were learning line upon line and precept upon precept. And Peter and Paul are doing the same. Galatians chapter 2, verses 15, 15 through 16, justified by faith of Jesus Christ. Paul identified the essential truth that made clear why the Gentile saints should not be excluded from dining with Jewish saints. Both groups were justified, pardoned from punishment for sin, by placing their faith in Jesus Christ, not by performing the works of the law of Moses. Peter himself expressed a similar view at the Jerusalem Council. See Acts 15, verses 7 through 11. So again, another good evidence that this is before that conference. And Peter finally declares the policy of the church in that Jerusalem conference council. Often when we speak of justification, we also speak about sanctification. Elder Todd D. Christofferson, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, explained how these doctrines are related but also separate. 
Quoting him, we may appropriately speak of one who is justified as pardoned without sin or guiltless. For example, whoso repenteth and is baptized in my name shall be filled, and if he durst in the end, behold, him will I hold guiltless before my Father at that day when I shall stand to judge the world. 3 Nephi 27, 16. Yet glorious as the remission of sins is, the atonement accomplishes even more. That more is expressed by Moroni. Moroni says, And again, if ye by the grace of God are perfect in Christ, and deny not his power, then are ye sanctified in Christ by the grace of God to the shedding of the blood of Christ, which is in the covenant of the Father unto the remission of your sins, that ye become holy and without spot. Moroni 10.33 Now back to Elder Christofferson. To be sanctified through the blood of Christ is to become clean and pure and holy. If justification removes the punishment for past sins, then sanctification removes the stain or the effects of sin. Galatians 2 verse 16 has sometimes been misunderstood to mean that salvation results only from our faith in Jesus Christ and that works of righteousness are not necessary for salvation. It is important to understand this verse in context. Here and in most places in Paul's writing, the word works does not refer generally to good deeds or efforts to live the gospel, our, meaning our obedience. Each time the word works appears in Paul's discussion in Galatians 2-3, through it is a part of the phrase works of the law, meaning the observance of the law of Moses, such as the rite of circumcision, dietary restrictions, or holy days. St. Paul's meaning is that the works of the law of Moses are not necessary for our salvation. Nevertheless, it is also true that our works understood as our efforts to live the commandments of the gospel, do not justify us or earn us salvation. We can do all the good works we want, and we can't save ourselves. If we could, then we wouldn't need a Savior. We are ultimately saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. See especially 2 Nephi 25, 23. President Dallin H. Oaks of the First Presidency referred to another one of Paul's statements in order to correct the inaccurate perception that we can be saved by our works alone. Quoting President Oaks, the Apostle Paul wrote that we should work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Philippians 2.12 Could that familiar, familiar expression mean that the sum total of our righteousness will win us salvation and exaltation? Could some of us believe that our heavenly parentage and our divine destiny allow us to pass through mortality and attain eternal life slow, solely on our own merits? Oh, the basis of what I have heard, I believe, on the basis of what I hear, have heard, I believe that some of us, some of the time, say things that can create that impression. We can forget that keeping the commandments, which is necessary, is not sufficient. As Nephi said, we must labor diligently to persuade everyone to believe in Christ and to be reconciled to God. For we know that it is by grace that we are saved after all that we can do. After all our obedience and good works, we cannot be saved from the effects of our sin without the grace extended by the atonement of Jesus Christ. End of Elder Oaks quote. And we do not earn that grace, brothers and sisters. It is given by the loving kindness of the Savior. We can, but we access it through faith. And the way we show faith is by keeping the commandments. Justification is distinct from sanctification. Because in justification, God does not make the sinner righteous. He declares that person righteous. Justification imputes Christ's righteousness to the sinner's account. Sanctification imparts righteousness to the sinner personally and practically. Justification takes place outside sinners and changes their standing. Romans 5, 1 through 2. Justification is an event sanctification a process. 
The two must be distinguished but can never be separated. God does not justify whom he does not sanctify, and he does not sanctify whom he does not justify. Both are essential elements of salvation. The only true perspective is to emphasize the infinite grace and mercy of Christ and the power of his atonement in the process of salvation. We, mar we mortals do not, I repeat, we do not merit salvation on our own. If we could earn salvation, Christ's mercy, by definition, wouldn't be mercy. It wouldn't be needed. Grace or mercy is not earned. Still, human behavior cannot be completely ignored. The very act of believing in Christ, having faith in him, is necessary righteous behavior because that accesses Christ's grace. As Nephi taught in 2 Nephi 25, 23, we are saved only by the grace of Christ apart from any and all good things we might do. But then again, we must do something. We cannot receive salvation in its fullest sense, either by doing nothing or by continuing in sin. Verse 17 in chapter 2. But someone says that in spite of their trust in Christ, some have fallen into sin and therefore require the guidance of the law. Is Christ then or the gospel the cause of their sin? Whatever conclusion we may draw, that one is manifestly absurd. This seems to state an objection of the Judasine party that faith in Christ is insufficient to keep men from faith. Or possibly it deals with an argument put forth by the Gentiles themselves that their faith in Christ was insufficient to enable them to withstand their temptations and that adoption of the law would be a help. In any case, St. Paul pushes the argument to its logical conclusion and shows its absurdity. Just because you're having a hard time living the gospel of Jesus Christ does not mean that the problem is with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 2, verses 18 through 20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Paul's statement, if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor, Galatians 2, 18, refers to the prospect of turning back to his former life, which was based on observing the law of Moses and leaving his new life based on faith in the Savior. If Paul had done this, he would have made himself a transgressor because it is not possible to do perfectly all things which are written in the book of the law, meaning the law of Moses, Galatians 3.10. He knew that no man could be justified by the law alone, see Galatians 3.10-11.22. Though Paul apparently still followed certain practices of the law of Moses, it was no longer the basis for his relationship with God, and his practices were not required for exaltation. Probably the reason why he still followed some is they're still trying to wean the Jews off of this. And so they're slowly trying to do that. His faith in Jesus Christ had transformed his life so completely that he described his old life as dead and declared that he was living a new life in Christ. Galatians 2, 18 through 20. Robert, Elder Robert L. Backman of the Seven explained that it is through total surrender to the Savior that we find new life he has for us. What Christ desires from each of us is surrender, complete and total, a voluntary gift of trust, faith, and love. The great writer C.S. Lewis captured the spirit of this surrender. Quoting C.S. Lewis said, Christ says, give me all. I don't want so much of your time and so much of your money and so much of your work. I want you. I have not come to torment your natural self, but to kill it. No half measures are good enough. I do not want to cut off a branch here and a branch there. I want to have the whole tree down. Hand over the whole natural self, all the desires which you think innocent, as well as the ones you think wicked, the whole outfit. I will give you a new self instead. In fact, I will give you myself. My own self shall become yours. 
brothers and sisters, we're going to have to learn to totally submit to the will of Christ if we're going to live in exaltation with him. Verse 21 in chapter 2, I do not thus make the grace of God of no effect, as I would if I clung to the law of Moses. For if we could be made righteous by the law of Moses, Christ need not have died for our salvation. Galatians chapter 3, God gave the gospel to Abraham. Galatians 3, 1 through 6, the gospel of Christ versus the law of Moses. God has spoken in successive ages, giving as much saving truth to every people as they are able to bear. Adam, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, and a host of others had the fullness of the everlasting gospel, the same gospel restored and established anew by Jesus and his apostles. To Moses and all Israel, God offered this gospel, which had blessed and saved men from the beginning, but Israel rejected the offer and refused to live by gospel standards. Remember? As I said, when he came down from the mount, they were riotously living and worshiping false idols. They weren't ready for it. Accordingly, God gave them the law of Moses, Moses, the lesser law, the law of carnal commandments, to school and train them for the day when once again they could be able to receive and live that which enabled men to enter into the rest of the Lord, which rest is the glory of the fullness of his glory. So it was to help lift them so they could finally receive the Melchizedek priesthood and the ordinances of the Melchizedek priesthood, which are found in the temple. Verses 1 through 6, Paul upbraids the Galatians for turning from the gospel of Christ back to the performances and rituals of the law of Moses. Through faith in Christ, he says, they had overcome the flesh, received the Holy Ghost, worked miracles, and had been accounted righteous before God, as was Abraham. Accordingly, he asked, what possible benefit can flow to you now by forsaking faith in Christ and returning to the dead performances of a dead law? Darn good question. Galatians 3, 7 through 9, and verses 16, 19, and verse 29. Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. To help the Gentile Christians in Galatia understand that they did not need to follow the practices of the law of Moses to inherit God's blessings, Paul taught that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. The Bible dictionary states that those of non-Israelite lineage, commonly known as Gentiles, are adopted into the house of Israel and become heirs of the covenant and the seed of Abraham to the ordinances of the gospel. Galatians 3, 26 through 29. All of Abraham's seed are promised exaltation if they are faithful. President James E. Faust of the First Presidency explained, What does it mean to be the seed of Abraham? Scripturally, it has a deeper meaning than being his literal descendants. The Lord made a covenant with Abraham, the great patriarch, that all nations would be blessed through him. Galatians 18, 18. Any man or woman can claim the blessings of Abraham. They become his seed and heirs to the promised blessings by accepting the gospel, being baptized, entering into temple marriage, being faithful in keeping their covenants, and helping to carry the gospel to all the nations of the earth. As Paul said, and if ye be Christ, then ye are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So that's how the Gentiles can become seeds of Abraham. When they are baptized, they are literally made descendants of Abraham. Galatians chapter 3, verse 8. Did saints have Christ? Did saints before Christ have the gospel preached to them? The prophet Joseph Smith taught that the fullness of the gospel was indeed taught to Abraham, as it was to all righteous saints who lived before the time of the Savior. Noah, Adam, Enoch. They all had the same gospel that you and I have taught today, taught to them. All that were ever saved were saved through the power of this great plan of redemption as much before the coming of Christ as since. Abraham offered sacrifice, and notwithstanding this, had the gospel preached to him, Galatians 3.8, that the offering of sacrifice was only to point the mind forward to Christ. 
we infer from these remarkable words of Jesus to the Jews, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad, John 8, 56. We conclude that whenever the Lord revealed himself to men in ancient days and commanded them to offer sacrifice to him, that it was done that they might look forward in faith to the time of his coming and rely upon the power of that atonement for remission of their sins. So do you see what's happening? They offered animal sacrifice that pointed forward to Christ's sacrifice. We now partake of bread and water what points back to the sacrifice offered by Jesus Christ. There's pointed forward. Our ordinance of the sacrament points us back to remember it. Adam and Eve are another example of ancient saints who offered animal sacrifice to the Lord while also being taught the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can see Moses 5, 5 through 8, and chapter 6, 50 through 66. Galatians Chapter 3, verses 10 through 14. The law of Moses alone cannot save, for salvation is in Christ. Hence the law became a curse in that it brings condemnation unless man obeys it in full. Cursed be he that conformeth not all the words of the law to do them. Deuteronomy 27, 26. Since only those who have faith in Christ are spirits alive, man is not justified by the works of the law of the Lord, for, justified by the works of the law alone. For the law be, came because men rejected faith in Christ and his gospel, and no one could live it completely without any sin. Only one did it, and that was Jesus Christ. And yet those of old were blessed through the law in accordance with the decree. Ye shall therefore keep my statute and my judgments, which if men do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. Leviticus 18.5. So he blesses them for living the law of Moses the best they can, as long as it helped pointed them to Christ. If it just became a traditional thing and it didn't bring them to Christ, it was of no use whatsoever. That is, those of old who kept the law, as for instance the Nephites, gained spiritual life through faith in Christ. See, they used it to point in Christ. You notice that when Christ comes to them, they immediately stop the law of Moses. They have no problem whatsoever making the transition. They never bring it up again. It's because they used it right to point to faith in Christ. Hence, Nephi's explanation that, notwithstanding we believe in Christ, we keep the law of Moses and look forward with steadfastness unto Christ, until the law shall be fulfilled. See, the Israelites were not using the law that way. For for this in the end was the law given. Wherefore the law had become dead unto us, and we are made alive in Christ because of our faith. Yet, we keep the law because of the commandments. But now, Paul continues, Christ has fulfilled the law of Moses that we are no longer cursed for failure to obey all of its performances. We have been redeemed from the curse since Christ, by hanging on the cross, thus removed the instrument whereby we were cursed. He became, as it were, a curse for us. And this very thing is symbolized in the law itself, which decrees a curse upon anyone hanged on a tree. Deuteronomy 21:23. Thus, that is by fulfilling the law of Moses and by bringing again the gospel which Abraham had, Christ has brought the blessings of Abraham to the Gentiles in that they, as adopted members of his family, receive all of the gospel blessings which Abraham himself enjoyed. Galatians 3:15 through 18, verse 15. To take a familiar illustration, even man's will, when ratified, no third party may annul or supplement. Verse 16. Now God's gracious promise to Abraham and his descendants is realized only in and through Christ, in whom all believers are one. Verse 17, Paul is saying, The law system, which arose long after the promise was made to Abraham, cannot change or nullify that promise. That is the promise that God made to Abraham of exaltation. Verse 18, And as salvation, the promise inheritance, must be either by obedience to the law or by grace. The case of Abraham proves that it was by grace. 
Because Abraham didn't even have the law of Moses. If you had to live the law of Moses to be saved, then Abraham was out of luck. No, it's by and through the grace of Jesus Christ. Galatians 19, the law of, uh, verse 19, the law of Moses was added because of transgression. Verse 19, if then the law could not save, what purpose did it serve? It had a temporary and educational purpose. It was designed to excite in men's hearts the consciousness of sin, which shows men their need of salvation, and so to point them to Christ. It was a system given not directly by God to the people, but indirectly through angels to Moses, who in his turn gave it to the nation. The prophet Joseph Smith taught, Quote, we find also that when the Israelites came out of Egypt, they had the gospel preached to them, according to Paul in his letter to the Hebrews, which says, For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not proffer them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Hebrews 4.2 It is said again in Galatians 3.19 that the law of Moses, or the Levitical law, was added because of transgression. What, we ask, was this law added to? If it was not added to the gospel, it must be plain that it was added to the gospel, since we learned that they had the gospel preached to them. End of quote of Joseph Smith. Galatians 3, 20-25 Wherefore then serveth the law? After teaching that the performances of the law of Moses do not justify us before God, Paul explained why God gave the law of Moses to, to Israel, Galatians 3, 19-25. The law was a temporary measure given to Israel by God because of Israel's transgression. It was a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ and would last only until Christ came, Galatians 3, 24. One way the law of Moses would have prepared Israel to receive Christ was to cause people to realize that they could not keep the law perfectly, and therefore they needed a Savior. Galatians 3.22 The Book of Mormon, Prophet Abinadi, gave a clear explanation of the purpose of the law of Moses found in Mosiah 13.29-30. The Joseph Smith translation provides insights into why the law of Moses was given and explains that Jesus Christ is the mediator of life. The Joseph Smith translation says, Wherefore then the law was added because of transgression till a seed should come to whom the promise was made in the law given to Moses, who was ordained by the hand of angels to be a mediator of this first covenant, the law. Now, this mediator was not a mediator of the New Covenant, but there is one mediator of the New Covenant who is Christ, as is written in the law concerning the promises made to Abraham and his seed. Now, Christ is the mediator of life, for this is the promise which God made unto Abraham. That's Joseph Smith's translation of Galatians chapter 3, verses 19 through 20. Galatians 3, verses 24 through 25, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Elder Paul D. Johnson of the 70 taught that the problem Paul addressed in Galatians teaches us about the importance of accepting changes the Lord makes in his kingdom. Quote, our willingness to accept changes in the kingdom helps the Lord hasten his work. Resistance to inspired change hinders progress to the kingdom. For example, in the last half of the New Testament, a major challenge the church faced was the issue of Gentile converts be assimilated as Christians. This issue surfaces in the book of Acts and is a theme in many of Paul's epistles. The problem stemmed from the fact that many Jewish Christians felt that Gentile converts should be required to adhere to the ceremonial law of Moses. Even Peter's dramatic revelation in the case of Cornelius that the gospel should be ta taught to the Gentiles, Acts 10 through 11, did not wipe the slate clean. And even after a special council in Jerusalem decided that the Gentile converts need not be subjected to the law, and an epistle was written explaining this decision, the issue remained a source of contention and division. See Acts 15. This was a major change for the church, and many members struggled with it. 
even as members struggle today when the first Prince and the Twelve make changes in the church. Continually quoting Elder Johnson, Many Jews and even Jewish Christians had lost sight of the intent and proper po position of the law. One reason for this was the unauthorized addition of requirements and traditions around the law that helped obscure its real intent. These additions and traditions were no longer a schoolmaster unto Christ, Galatians 3.24, pointing our souls to him, Jacob 4.5 but rather were so burdensome and consuming that many Jews looked beyond the mark, Jacob 4.14, and put the perverted law in place of the lawgiver himself. Remember, the Pharisees added a lot of things to the law of Moses that were never given by Christ, and thus just they lose the whole meaning of what the law was for. Ending Elder Johnson's quote, I hope when we face challenges in the kingdom, we can be like Paul and help foster that change, rather reacting like those who fought the change and hinder the progress of the work. Galatians 3, 26-27, Faith and Baptism. Paul's words found in Galatians 3, 26-27 show that faith in Jesus Christ is linked to baptism. The children of God that Paul mentions are those who have entered into a covenant relationship with God by being baptized. Verse 26, children of God, means sons and daughters of Jesus Christ, adopted members of his family. Because of the covenant which ye have made, ye shall be called the children of Christ, his sons and his daughters. King Benjamin said, For behold, this day he hath spiritually begotten you. For ye say that your hearts are changed through faith on his name. Therefore ye are born of him, and have become his sons and his daughters. And under his head ye are made free. And there is no other head whereby ye can be made free. There is no other name given whereby salvation cometh. That's Mosiah 5, 7 through 8. This, of course, is one of the ways in which the Son of God becomes the Father enabling him to say, I am the Father, I am the light, and the life, and the truth of the world. Also see Ether 4.12. Verse 27 in chapter 3, put on Christ. Meaning, in the phrase put on Christ, the verb translated as put on comes from the Greek word endu, endio, which means to endow. The Greek word means to clothe oneself, and this phrase means to symbolically put on the attributes and enabling power of Jesus Christ. See Ephesians 4, 22, 24, 6, 11, and Colossians 3, 9 through 12. Similarly, when faithful members of the church receive their temple endowments, they covenant to take upon themselves the attributes of a Christ-like life. Also to put on Christ is to take upon ourselves his name. King Benjamin's counsel to those who had entered the covenant of baptism was, quoting King Benjamin, to take upon you the name of Christ, all you that have entered in the covenant with God, that you should be made obedient unto the end of your that you should be obedient unto the end of your lives. And it shall come to pass that whosoever doth this shall be found at the right hand of God, for he shall know the name by which he is called. For he shall be called by the name of Christ. Mosiah 5, 8-9 Men in this day are commanded, quote, To take upon you the name of Christ, and speak the truth in soberness. And as many as repent, and are baptized in my name, which is Jesus Christ, and endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Behold, Jesus Christ is the same name which is given of the Father, and there is none other name given whereby man can be saved. Wherefore, men, all men, must take upon them the name which is given of the Father, for in that name shall they be called at the last day. Wherefore, if they know not the name by which they are called, they cannot have place in the kingdom of my Father. End of quote. Doctrine and Covenants 18, 21 through 25. And each time the saints partake of the sacrament, they certify anew to the Father that they are willing to take upon them the name of his Son. Galatians 3, verse 27, baptized unto Christ. Meaning, after announcing Christ's divinity, John wrote, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. 
But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. John 1, 11 through 12. Then in modern times, that same Lord said he was, quote, the same which came in the meridian of time unto mine own, and mine own received me not. But to as many as received me, gave I power to become my sons. Even so will I give unto many as will receive me, power to become my sons. And very verily I say unto you, he that receiveth my gospel receiveth me, and he that receiveth not my gospel receiveth not me. And this is my gospel, repentance and baptism by water, and then cometh the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost, even the Comforter, which showeth all things and teacheth the peaceable things of the kingdom. Unquote. Doctrine and Covenants 39, 3-6. Now, to not be confused, you sisters and daughters of Christ, when he says that you become my sons, he's using that in the generic term when we talk about man, meaning mankind, meaning male and female. So this is referring to both male and female. Galatians 3, 28-29, one in Christ Jesus. Paul taught that the cultural separations that existed between Jews and Gentiles, slaves and masters, or men and women, should no longer divide people in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Each member's covenant relationship with Jesus Christ creates unity among all members. Through baptism into Jesus Christ Church, we become part of Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise given to the ancient patriarch, Galatians 3.29, as the Lord declared in modern revelation through the prophet Joseph Smith. See Doctrine and Covenants 86.9 and Abraham 2.6-11. President Dallin H. Oaks explained how the church today, like the New Testament church, extends the invitation all to, be, to come unto Christ. Quote, Jesus and his apostles did not attempt to make Gentiles into Jews. They taught Gentiles and Jews, attempting to make each of them into followers of Christ. Similarly, the present-day servants of the Lord do not attempt to make Filipinos or Asians or Africans into Americans. The Savior invites all to come unto him, and his servants seek to persuade all people to become Latter-day Saints. End of quote. President James E. Faust explained how there can be both diversity and unity in the church. Quote, As we move into more and more countries in the world, we find a rich cultural diversity in the church. Yet, everywhere there can be a unity of the faith. Ephesians 4.13 Each group brings special gifts and talents to the table of the Lord. We can all learn much of value from each other. But each of us should also voluntarily seek to enjoy all the unifying and saying covenants, ordinances, and doctrines of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We do not lose our identity in becoming members of this church. We become heirs to the kingdom of God, having joined the body of Christ and spiritually set aside some of our personal differences to unite in a greater spiritual cause. We say to all who have joined the church, keep all that is noble, good, and uplifting in your cultural culture, and personal identity. However, under the authority and power of the keys of the priesthood, all differences yield as we seek to become heirs to the kingdom of God, unite in following those who have the keys of the priesthood, and seek the divinity within us. End of quote. Galatians chapter 4, a little introduction. As men pursue the goal of eternal life, they first enter in at the gate of repentance and baptism, thereby taking upon themselves the name of Christ. They then gain power to become his sons and daughters, to be adopted into his family, to be brothers and sisters in his kingdom. Baptism standing alone does not transform them into family members, but it opens the door to such a blessed relationship. And if men so live as to obtain the Spirit, are in fact born again, then they become members of the Holy Family. Then if they press forward with the steadfastness in Christ, keeping the commandments and living by every word that proceedeth forth from the mouth of God, they qualify for celestial marriage, and this gives them power to become the sons of God, meaning the Father. They thus become joint heirs with Christ, who is his natural heir. 
Those who are sons of God in this sense are the ones who become gods in the world to come. Section 76, 54 to 60. They have exaltation in godhood because the family unit continues in eternity. Doctrine and Covenants 132, 19 through 24. Celestial Mary standing alone does not transform them into sons of God and make them joint heirs with Christ, but it opens the door to this greatest of all blessings. And if those involved keep their covenants, they are assured of receiving the promised inheritance. Through Christ and his atoning sacrifice, they are begotten in sons and daughters unto God. Doctrine and Covenants 76, 24, meaning the Father. And all those who are begotten through me, Christ says, are partakers of his glory. Doctrine and Covenants 93, 22. Galatians 4, chapters 1 through 9. Thou art no more a servant but a son. There are some ways in which our covenant relationship with God is like the relationship of a servant to a master. See Luke 17, 7 through 17, or 17, 7 through 10, or Messiah 2, 17, 21, and chapter 5, 13. But Paul taught the Galatians that our relationship with God is better understood as that of a child to a father. Galatians 4, 6 through 9. He declared to the Galatians that being son in the gospel covenant was far better than being a servant to the false gods they had worshipped before they accepted the truth. In the parable of the prodigal son, the Savior taught that our Father in heaven wants us to be his children in the gospel covenant. The parable teaches that the wayward son believed he had become permanently unworthy to be called his father's son and asked to be his servant. But the father accepted him back as his son. Luke 15, 17 through 24. Israel, under the law of Moses, was being trained and prepared for the coming of Christ so they could receive the adoption of sons. Similarly, though we are heirs of God, destined to inherit all that the Father hath, Dr. Covenants 84, 38, yet as long as we are in mortality, we are under tutors and governors. We are being schooled and trained and prepared to use our inheritance wisely when it is finally received. Verse 4 in chapter 4. Usually the scriptures speak of birth as the seed of man. In this verse is the only place in all of scripture where birth is referred to the seed of the woman. This is in reference to the birth of Christ, who was born of a mortal mother, and God was his father. Thus Christ was not born of the seed of a mortal man. He was born of the seed of a mortal woman. Christ himself, while dwelling in mortality, was subject to the law of Moses until such time as he, the giver of the law, hath fulfilled and abolished it. Verse 6 in chapter 4. Abba is the Aramaic term for father. And the adopted sons in the family of the eternal father are privileged to address him who is the ruler of the universe in this intimate way, which I told you earlier means daddy or papa. Galatians 4, 1 through 9, Thou art no more servants but a son, continued. Verses 8 and 9, verse 8, Before the Galatians gained the knowledge of God by a revelation from the Holy Ghost, they served false gods. Verse 9, Paul is saying, These Galatians had forsaken the world and accepted the truth. Now they are leaving the gospel for the practices and rituals of the Mosaic law. Galatians 4, 9 through 14, loss of joy. Paul reminded the Galatian saints of how well they had received him earlier. Galatians 4, 13 through 15. The question at the beginning of verse 15 could be par paraphrased in this way. What has happened to the joy you once spoke of? They had once received Paul's teachings with great happiness, as if he were an angel, but that happiness was now gone. The Jewish Christian teachers, who had led the Galatian saints astray, had opposed Paul and imposed the burdens of the Mosaic law upon the people, leading to a loss of happiness. The gospel of Jesus Christ, on the other hand, is meant to bring, everlasting, to bring lasting joy. The Joseph Smith translation helps explain the meaning of Galatians 4.12. 
quote him, Brethren, I beseech you to be perfect as I am perfect, for I am persuaded as ye have a knowledge of me. Ye have not injured me at all by your sayings. Paul asked the Galatian saints to follow the example of someone who had lived the gospel and been greatly blessed. The gospel is designed, is designed to lead men to finite perfection in this life and infinite perfection in the life to come. The one is a relative degree of perfection, the other the kind of absolute perfection possessed by deity. See Hebrews 6, 1 through 3. And here Paul testifies that the gospel had worked in his life and that he was whatever minister should be a perfect example. Verses 13 through 15. When Paul first preached the to the Galatians, he was suffering from some physical affliction, and yet they received him with as much deference as though he had been an angel or the Lord himself, which is symptomatic of the way receptive investigators always bear with the, and rejoice in Christ's ministers. Galatians 4, 15-20. Verse 15, he is saying, How great is the change in you since the time when you would have made any sacrifice for me. Plucked eyes means made any sacrifice for me. So great was your former kindness. Verse 16, do you now regard me as hostile to you because I urge you to loyalty to Christ? Verse 17, the Judaizers are courting your favor only that they may make you their partisans and supporters. They zealously seek you in no good way. Nay, they desire to shut you out that you may seek them the Jewish extremists. Verse 18, it is well to be the object of others' interest in a good cause, and that at times, and not merely when I am with you. Verses 19 and 20, Paul is saying, I assure you my desire that you should be molded after Christ's pattern is intense, and I would fain visit you and adopt a less centrist tone in the hope of winning you back. Galatians 4, 21-31, the allegory of the two wives and sons of Abraham. As recorded in Galatians 4, 21-31, Paul drew a comparison between Abraham's two wives and two sons. Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained this comparison. He said, Paul here uses the life of Abraham as an allegory to dramatize the superiority of the gospel over the law of Moses a mode of teaching designed to drive his doctrine home anew each time his hearers think of Abraham and his life. Hagar, the bondwoman, bore Ishmael, and Sarah, the free woman, brought forth Isaac. Ishmael was born after the flesh, while Isaac was a child of promise, came forth after the spirit. Hagar is thus made to represent the Old Covenant, the Law of Moses, the covenant under which men were subject to the bondage of sin, while Sarah symbolized the New Covenant, the Gospel, the covenant under which men are made through, free, free from bondage and sin through Christ. Mount Sinai, from whence the law came, and Jerusalem, from whence it is now administered, symbolize the law and their children are in bondage. But the spiritual Jerusalem, the heavenly city of which the saints shall be citizens, is symbolized by Sarah, and she is the mother of free men. Sarah, who so long barren as our spiritual mother, has now made us all, like Isaac, heirs of promise. But it is now as it was then, those born of after the flesh, war against those born of the spirit. And as God rejected Ishmael and accepted Isaac, so does he now reject those who cleave to the law of Moses and accept those who now turn to Christ. Paul's teachings about the two covenants provided a foundation for his teachings found in Galatians 5, that being part of the new covenant, mean being led to do good by the Spirit, not by the law. Paul's contrasting image of bondage and freedom in the allegory of the two covenants also laid the groundwork for his teachings about liberty found in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1 and 13. Galatians chapter 5, stand fast in the gospel liberty. Galatians 5, 1, Christ hath made us free. 
In Galatians 5.1, Paul describes the Old Covenant law of Moses as a yoke of bondage. Elsewhere in the scriptures, bondage usually describes the captivity of sin. But Paul uses the word to describe the limitations and burdens of the law of Moses. By contrast, the Savior taught that his yoke was easy, a light burden, and those who took his yoke upon them would find rest unto their souls, Matthew 11, 28, 30. Paul taught that the liberty of Christ meant that disciples were free to be led by the Spirit and were not constrained by the law, meaning the law of Moses, Galatians 5, 22 through 23. President Howard W. Hunter explained that when our religious observance is done mechanically, but because of our love of the Lord, in complete freedom of faith, we narrow our distance from Him and our relationship to Him becomes intimate. We are released from the bondage of legalism and we are touched by the Spirit and feel a oneness with Him. So we cannot mechanically just live through the gospel and expect to live with Christ. We must do it by completely, submitly, completely submitting our will to Him and freely turning over our agency to Christ. And then we can have the intimate relationship with the Father and the Son. President Gordon B. Hinckley explained how the gospel of Christ makes us spiritually free. True freedom lies in obedience to the counsels of God. The gospel is not a philosophy of repression as so many regard it. It is a plan of freedom that gives discipline to appetite and direction to behavior. Its fruits are sweet and its rewards are liberal. End of quote. Paul admonished the Galatian saints not to become entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Galatians 5.1 While today we do not worry about becoming entangled with the law of Moses, we sometimes either consciously or unwittingly bind ourselves to the things of the world. As we do, do so, we place ourselves in a comparable position to Paul's opponents in Galatia. Christian liberty does not come from an absence of law. It comes from willingly yoking ourselves to Christ and to his law. The difficulty comes when we refuse to give up other yokes as Paul opponents in Galatia. The yoke they clung to was the law of Moses. In our day, our yoke, our law of Moses, is anything that pre prevents or impedes our total commitment to Christ and his gospel. End of President Hinckley's quote. Galatians 5, 2 through 4. The Galatian saints could not be justified by the law of Moses. Paul explained to the Galatian saints that error of relying on the law of Moses for salvation and diminishing faith in Christ, and diminishing faith in Christ. If they did this, Christ's atonement would profit them nothing and would be of no effect. Galatians 5, 2 through 5. When Paul addressed whosoever you are justified by the law, Galatians 5, 4, he probably spoke with irony since he had already made clear that no one can be justified by the law. See Galatians 3, 11. The sense of Paul's words might be, you who think you can be justified by the law. For such people, Paul taught, Christ has become of no effect, Galatians 5.4. Paul's statement, you are fallen from grace, Galatians 5.4, means that if people try to attain salvation only by observing the law of Moses, they have fallen from the divine favor. Verse 4 in chapter 5, fallen from grace. Those who keep the commandments strive to live by every word that proceeds forth from the mouth of God, find favor in his sight. Their course of conduct is pleasing to him, and they are in a state of grace. That is, because of their personal righteousness, deity pours out his love, mercy, and goodness upon them in bountiful measure. They are guided by the Spirit, have power to work miracles, and do good, and frequently taste the good things of the world to come. To fall from grace is to turn from such a course of obedience so that the goodness of God departs and the former saint is left to his own power and strength. God is no longer pleased with his conduct and no longer pours out upon him special blessings. Thus the prophet Joseph Smith in his discussing whether a person who is once in grace is always in grace or whether having fallen from grace he can return again to that blessed state, says, If men have received the word of God 
and tasted of the powers of the world to come. If they shall fall away, it is impossible to renew them again, seeing they have crucified the Son of God afresh and put him to open shame. So that there is a possibility of falling away, you could not be renewed again, and the power of Elijah cannot seal against this sin, for this is reserved for this is a reserve made in the seals and powers of the priesthood. When he means you have received powers of the world to come, when you have seen, when you have been brought into the presence of the Lord, you've had your calling election made sure, you have been in the presence of the Son of the Father and then fall away, then you cannot be returned. On the other hand, if a man is not worthy of so great a condemnation, he can repent and attain again his favor state of grace. For all faithful members of the church, the revealed counsel is, there is a possibility that man may fall from grace and depart from the living God. Therefore, let the church take heed and pray always, lest they fall into temptation. Yea, and even let those who are sanctified take heed also. Doctrine and Covenants 20, 32-34. Galatians chapter 5, verses 5 through 12. Verse 5, For it is through the operation of the Holy Spirit, not through symbols in our flesh and in consequences of our faith in Christ, and not of works we perform, that we hope for justification before God. Verse 6, Belief alone? No. Jesus said many times, keep my commandments. If belief alone were sufficient, then why did Paul write letters encouraging the saints to live the gospel? It is not circumcision and the consequent conformity to the law of Moses that save, nor is salvation available to the Gentiles through their systems of religion. Salvation is in Christ and comes by faith in his holy name and in no other way. Love is the motivating power underlying all things. The atonement, righteous living, all good things grow out of love, the love of God for his children, and the love of his children for each other and their creator. Verse 7, you are making good progress in the Christian life. Who has misled you into disloyalty to the gospel? You once kept the commandments. Why don't you do so now? Verse 8, this teaching by which you have been led astray is not of God. Verse 9, And though it has so far done only a little mischief, it will spread like leaven. Verse 10, I have good hope, however, that you will now heed my exhortation, but the leader of this sedition will receive a heavy punishment. Verse 11, As for the accusation that I myself sometimes commend circumcision, were that the case, would the Jews still persecute me? I, Paul, have not taught doctrines which led you astray, as that circumcision is necessary to salvation. If that were true, I should no longer be giving them offense through my preaching of the crucified Christ as the author of salvation. Verse 12, But enough! I wish that these men who are perverting your faith by insisting upon circumcision were cut off completely probably referring to excommunication, avoid the influence of false teachers. They shall condemn and should be excommunicated. Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. Verse 13, cling then to your freedom from legal rules and customs. But remember that freedom means not license, but loving service. Called unto, ministry, unto liberty means called to the gospel, which is the perfect law of liberty called to forsake the performances and rituals of the Mosaic system, called to the truth which makes men free, free from the bondage of darkness and sin. Use your Christian liberty properly. Be wise in the days of your probation. Strip yourselves of all uncleanliness. Ask not that ye may consume it on your lust, but ask with a firmness unshaken that ye will yield to no temptation, but that ye will serve the true and living God. Mormon 9.28, verse 14, For love is the essence of God's law, verse 15, whereas mutual backbiting and hatred can only end in the destruction of one another's spiritual life. Galatians 5.16-21, Walk in the Spirit. Paul taught that we should walk in the Spirit, and that if we do, we will overcome the lust of the flesh, Galatians 5.16. 
Paul's words warned against participating in the works of the flesh. See Galatians 5, 19-21. Works of the flesh are sins that will keep us out of the Lord's kingdom. These sins fall into four general categories. One, sexual sins. Fornication refers to any immortal, immoral sexual relationship. Lasciviousness refers to unbridled or excessive lust. Number two, sins from the religious realm, such as idolatry and witchcraft. Number three, sins against other persons. Variance can be interpreted as discord and is an outgrowth of hatred. Emulations are actions carried out in order to equal or be su superior to another, off often out of jealousy. And number four, sins associated with alcohol, drunkenness, and revilings. Paul warned that those who habitually participate in these sins shall not inherit the kingdom of God, Galatians 5.21. Galatians 5.17, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. Elder Neil A. Maxwell explains, quote, One major reason for the various reminders to us about avoiding the failure of our faith is the war within the soul, the war between the flesh and the individual spirit. Paul laid it out candidly and specifically, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are count contrary the one to the other so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Galatians 5.17 Continue, Elder Maxwell. When Jesus observed his sleeping apostles in the Garden of Gethsemane, he commanded that the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. His commandment was more than a kindly commentary on sleeping apostles, who would have desired to stay awake. It was a tremendous insight which clearly pertains to life and to faith. When we read in the scriptures of man's weakness, this term includes the generic but necessary weakness inherent in the human, general human condition in which the flesh has such an insistent, incessant impact upon the spirit. See Ether 12, 28 to 29. Weakness likewise includes, however, our specific, specific individual weaknesses which we are expected to overcome Life has a way of exposing these weaknesses. If we are meek, what is an individual weakness can later even become a strength. Hence the Lord said, I give unto them weakness that they may be humble. Ether 12.27 For those who seek to live by celestial principles, however, the basic conflict between the flesh and the spirit will go on individually until the flesh is finally subdued. That means subdued to the spirit. See Galatians 5, 16-25. Continuing Elder Maxwell, The eventual and eternal reunion of body and spirit, when these are inseparably connected after the resurrection, will bring a glorious fullness of joy. Dr. Covenants 93, 33. Until then, however, we are, said Brigham Young, encumbered with this flesh, with its weakness, blindness, and lethargy. The constraints of the flesh contribute to our disposition to weep or mourn. So much of our fear and trembling arises from anxieties which drives us to know how to save ourselves pertaining to the flesh. Even our fear of trials, continued said President Young, is on account of our tabernacles. So while we are in the flesh, the gospel is calculated to deliver those who live by its principles from all those fears, whereas the spirit has no disposition to weep or to mourn. I mean, as long as we are natural fallen men, we will not completely overcome the weaknesses of the flesh. They will always hound us. Hence, Jesus' utterance, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak, is a profound declaration and not merely an observation about sleepy apostles. If we reflect on the process, we realize that our bodily fears and anxieties often do focus on pain, hunger, deprivation, fatigue, and even death. These are certainly natural to the natural man. The natural man, by the way, is very much at home in a consumer society. 
For in a consumer society, there are inevitably two kinds of slaves, the prisoners of addiction and the prisoners of envy. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that they cannot do the things that they would. So, we will always struggle with weaknesses while we're down here. The key is to use the grace of Jesus Christ to work through them, to help us with them, and to slowly start to overcome them. Galatians 5, 22-25, the fruits of the Spirit. Paul gave the Galatians several examples of the fruits of the Spirit. Elder Dennis E. Simmons of the 70 gave further examples of the fruits of the Spirit and identified where these blessings are described in Scripture. Paul described the fruits of the Spirit, that is, what the Spirit produces. The, spirit, the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, and he observed, against such there is no law. Meaning, in other words, the Spirit can penetrate anything. No law can be passed which will preclude the Spirit from doing his work with an obedient follower of Christ. The scriptures teach us that the Spirit enlightens the mind, DNC 615, leads to do good, to do justly, to walk, and humbly to judge righteously, DNC 1112, fills the souls with joy, DNC 1113, reveals the truth of all things, Romans 10 5, bears record of the Father and Son, DNC 2027, Knows all things, DNC 4217, conceives, sees DNC 108, gives knowledge, DNC 129 26, speaks in a still small voice, 1 Nephi 1745, teaches a man to pray, 2 Nephi 32 8, brings about a mighty change, Mosiah 5 2, gives assur assurances, Alma 5 58 11, Fills us with hope and perfect love, Roman 8, 8, or Roman 8, 26. Gives liberty, 2 Corinthians 3, 17. Comforts, John, see John 14, 16. And speaks peace, Alma 58, 11. Is available, DNC 6, 14. So all these are available to us. End of quote from Elder Simmons. Galatians 6, bear one another's burdens. Galatians 6, 1 through 6, verse 1. Christ came to save sinners. The gospel is designed to restore erring saints to grace and perfection. The Lord does not desire the failure, excommunication, and spiritual death of his people. The program of the church is to restore, renew, reactivate, to bring all who will come to that full fellowship that leads to eternal life. Verse 2, as members of the family of Christ, church members treat each other as brothers and sisters. One of the express promises made in the waters of baptism is, I come to bear the burdens of my brethren in the church that they may be light. Mosiah 18.8 8. The law of Christ, meaning the law of the gospel. Doctrine and Covenants 88.21 Verse 3, the dangers of having an inflated ego. And if any man shall seek to build up himself and seek not my counsel, he shall have no power, and his folly shall be made manifest. Doctrine and Covenants 136, 19. Verse 4. Test yourselves and see if you are keeping the commandments and can therefore rejoice in your own good works. Verse 5. Men are accountable for their own sins. Verse 6. Communication is a two-way street. Both teacher and learner must be enlightened by the Spirit, in which event he that preacheth and he that receiveth understand one another, and both are edified and rejoiced together. Doctrine and Covenants 50.22 Marvin J. Ashton gives some significant teachings that relate to bearing one another's burdens. He quotes, During an informal fireside addressed, help, 
fire, so let me try it again. During an informal fireside address held with a group of adult Latter-day Saints, the leader directing the discussion invited participants by asking the question, how can you tell if someone is converted to Christ? For 45 minutes, those in attendance made numerous suggestions in response to this question, and the leader carefully wrote down each answer on a large blackboard. All the comments were thoughtful and appropriate. But after a time, this great teacher erased everything he had written. Then, acknowledging that all of the comments had been worthwhile and appreciated, he taught a vital principle. He said, The best and most clear indicator that we are progressing spiritually and coming unto Christ is the way we treat other people. Would you consider this idea for a moment, that the way we treat the members of our family, our friends, those with whom we work each day, is as, is as important as some of the more noticeable gospel principles we sometimes emphasize? Imagine what could happen in today's world, or in our own wards, our families, or priesthood quorums and auxiliaries, if each of us would vow to cherish, watch over, and comfort one another. Imagine the possibilities. One young woman serving in a stake relief society presidency and at a time also laboring under the pressure of an especially challenging project lost her temper one morning during a presidency meeting. The cause of her unhappiness had little to do with the question at hand and was related more to the fact that at the time she was laboring under intense home pressure on a major task and was feeling frustrated and frazzled. Afterwards, she was embarrassed at her behavior and immediately called to apologize for her outburst. Her friends in the presidency were generous and told her not to think another thing about it. Still, she wondered if they might think less of her now that she had been seen her, now that they'd seen her less than her best. But that evening, the doorbell rang around dinner time, and there stood the other members of the presidency with a dinner in hand. We knew when you lost your cool this morning that you just you must just be worn out. We thought a little supper might help. We want you to know we love you. The young woman was amazed. In spite of her outburst that morning, her friends were there to offer support rather than criticism rather than seize the opportunity to bash her. They were filled with the spirit of charity. If we could look into each other's hearts and understand the unique challenges each of us think, or each of us face, I think we would treat each other much more gently, with more love, patience, tolerance, and care. If the adversary can influence us to pick on each other, to find fault, bash, and undermine, to judge or humiliate or taunt, half his battle is won. Why? Because through this sort of conduct may not equate with succumbing to grievous sin, it nevertheless neutralizes us spiritually. The Spirit of the Lord cannot dwell where there is bickering, judging, contention, or any kind of bashing. Once again, may I emphasize the principle that when we truly become converted to Jesus Christ, committed to him, an interesting thing happens. Our attention turns to the welfare of our fellow man, and the way we treat each other becomes increasingly filled with patience, kindness, a gentle acceptance, and a desire to play a positive role in their lives. This is the beginning of true conversion. Let us open our arms to each other, accept each other for who we are, assume everyone is doing the best he or she can, and look for ways to help leave quiet messages of love and encouragement instead of being destructive with bashing. End of Marvin J. Ashton's quote. Galatians 6 through 7. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Paul taught that God cannot be mocked. For the law of harvest applies to spiritual things as well as physical things. See Galatians 6, 7 through 9. He admonished that we not be weary in well-doing and faint not, meaning enduring to the end. Galatians 6, 9. 
for we will reap the blessings of our righteous actions, as well as, well as the spiritually destructive results of sinful choices. See Mosiah 7, 30-31. Elder Tom L. Perry of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles spoke of the blessed assurance by the law of the harvest, quote, The Lord is bound by his divine law to bless us of our righteousness. And then he quotes Galatians 6, 7 through 9. May God bless us that we may now sow to the Spirit in order that our harvest will be everlasting. Isn't that interesting? The Lord is bound by divine law. If we will just be righteous. In an address focused on helping us avoid being deceived by Satan, President Dallin H. Oates explained that the consequences of sin mentioned by Paul reflect divine justice. Quote, if we indulge in drugs or pornography or other evils that the Apostle Paul called sowing to the flesh, eternal law dictates that we harvest corruption rather than eternal life. That is the justice of God, and mercy cannot rob justice. If an eternal law is broken, the punishment affixed to the law must be suffered. Some of this can be satisfied by the Savior's atonement, but the merciful cleansing of a soiled sinner comes only after repentance, which for some sins is a prolonged and painful process. End of quote. Galatians 6, 9, Let us not be weary in well-doing. Elder Neil A. Mackerel writes, It is essential to avoid that immobilizing weariness which can be a prelude to giving up. Professional athletes say that the legs are the first things to go. In, disciple, the fir in, the, in discipleship, the first thing to go is meekness. If a person is not humble, he may, for instance, feel he already knows enough to be bored by any more of the gospel. Hence, he need not study. Likewise, if he not humble, one soon lackens in giving service, and he not merely going through the motions of worship or membership. In such circumstances, loss is the sense of intellectual excitement over the gospel, and also the needed satisfactions and reinforcement that comes from serving in the church. This boredom and weariness, of course, are self-inflicted. Then, once we are no longer anxiously engaged, we make ourselves vulnerable to sin, DNC 58.27. Whether through boredom or sin, we slow down or depart from the path. We faint in our minds and grow stale, Hebrews 12.3. Such intellectual fainting brings a loss of spiritual consciousness and our strength and, and, our strength and quickly ebbs. Physical fatigue, of course, is to be expected. From it, we can recover by rest and wise renewal. The form of fatigue noted above, however, can be difficult to recover from unless we can reignite and become once again anxiously engaged. So let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Galatians 6, 9. In the particularized renewal of our covenants, in our prayerful pleadings, in and through church service, and in the renewal of our minds through the study of the Word and the Holy Scriptures, in these activities is to be found the fundamental renewal that is vital to the continuing journey of the man and the woman of Christ. For instance, in the renewal of our temple covenants, we can be nurtured and encouraged by connecting the present with the past and the future. If we are deprived of these renewing opportunities over a sustained period of time, however, parent, present cares can blur the past and cloud the future. Special tribute is due, then, to those righteous church members who do not weary despite sustained adversity, who regularly and quietly endure their special trials in faith day by day. These individuals, and they are all around us, cope with the short and sharp trials as well as the long and tough ones. The later involves severe and reoccurring demands that at times seem even beyond the capacity of these exemplars to meet. Yet even in their fatigue and amid the sheer repetitiveness of it all, they do not cry out incessantly, How long, O Lord, how long? These who thus inspire the rest of us deserve assurance, and this they should allow to seep into the marrow of their souls. 
Though still imperfect, they are doing not only the right thing, but also the things that matter most. Moreover, they are doing it far better than they think. End of Elder Maxwell's quote. Galatians 6, 10 through 17. Verse 10, Though the saints, as their strength and circumstances permit, do good to all men, their special obligation is to bless and help their fellow saints, the members of their church family. Verse 11, Look at my own bold handwriting in which I have written this letter as proof of my longing for your salvation. Verse 12, To sum up, those who are insistent on your circumcision are doing so in order to curry favor with the Jews to avoid persecution. For, verse 13, as Christians, they do not themselves consistently observe the law, but are making a show of zeal for it by in inducing you to assume its burdens. But because they are compromising the gospel with the law of Moses, they were not and could not center their whole hearts on Christ and the salvation made possible through his atoning sacrifice. Verse 14, but the only true ground of glorying is the cross by which I have been put to death to the sins of the world. Verse 15, the gospel is for all, Israel of that day who are circumcised and the Gentiles who are not. Salvation, regardless of circumcision, comes to all who accept Christ, are baptized, receives the Holy Ghost, and are born again, becoming new creatures alive to the things of the Spirit. Verse 16, peace and mercy are bestowed upon the obedient. And in verse 17, the marks of the Lord Jesus, Paul means, the scars in Paul's flesh which testified of his steadfastness in the face of, pers Corinthian, in, in the face of persecution. See 2 Corinthians 11, 23 through 27. Also the holy symbols test typifying faith in Christ and his gospel which are borne by all the faithful. Marx is the English word used here, translated the Greek stigmata. These marks are not marks of shame, but of faithfulness. Paul indeed had marks on his body, physical marks, testifying of his undying efforts in behalf of the saints. At Antioch of Poseida, he was forcibly expelled. At Lystra, he was stoned and left for dead. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel.